Good morning. Good to see you. My name is Gavin. I serve our church family as one of the pastors. And uh, it's a beautiful day. It's going to be like 78 today, you guys. This is amazing. Praise God. Uh, we'll get you out of here in about two hours. Grab your Bibles. Uh, laugh uncomfortably. Galatians uh, chapter 2. We're going to hit the first 10 verses of chapter 2 as we continue to work our way through the book. Uh, I like to fish. Anyone here like to fish? I like to fish. Yes, yeah, some fishermen that we like to fish. We like to fry fish and eat fish. And it's just an excuse to be outside for me more than anything. And uh, my family and I, we actually live in north central Omaha, right by Cunningham Lake. And so uh, for the first few years that we lived there, it's nice being close to a lake. We would go and, and hike and have picnics on my day off and, and fish and all that. But in 2018, they found zebra mussels in Lake Cunningham. Has anyone heard of zebra mussels? These are little demon things that get in water. They're horrible. They're an invasive species. Uh, they're taking over a lot of waterways in the Midwest, uh, not native to the area. Uh, uh, marine biologists think they came from somewhere in Eurasia, so think Russia. They were brought into the Great Lakes system through ships that would um, empty their uh, water uh, that goes into the ballast. The ballast water would come out, is how we think they got here. And they got into the Great Lakes, and they got into the river systems, and now they're getting into lakes. And they travel from lake to lake by attaching their larvae to boats. And so when one boat is in one lake, and it gets the little larvae, and it goes into another lake, then the zebra mussels come in. And the problem with the zebra mussels is that they filter out all the al uh, algae that native species need for food, and they can wipe out almost the entire ecosystem in a lake. So terrible, terrible thing. So this happened in Lake Cunningham. They found zebra mussels, so they had to drain the lake. The only way to get rid of them, you have to drain the lake to a real low level so that it gets a hard freeze. Kills all the fish, kills everything, and then you can restart it the next year and stock it. So in 2018, they drained the lake. 2019, they started to refill it, and they found zebra mussels again. So they had to drain it again, I don't know what happened last year, but they didn't fill it last year. So for three years, what used to be a beautiful lake, teeming with life, life-giving to my family and I, has been a mud pit full of weeds and like old tires, and it's a complete eyesore. And uh, they're just starting to refill it this year uh, to the glory of God. Thank goodness. So uh, now, if you go to Area Lake, sometimes you'll see they actually have signs that say, you cannot put your boat in this water Unless you have power washed it, you've scrubbed it down. Some lakes have a, a check-in station where the game and parks will actually come examine your boat because these zebra mussels are like unwanted hitchhikers. They just attach to the boat and they can ruin an entire lake. Now, none of that has anything to do with my sermon. You just want to let you know about the zebra mussels and fishing. Uh, not true. I say all of that to say that just like boats can carry invasive and deadly species from lake to lake, the same thing can happen with people and churches, okay? People can pick up toxic teaching, life-sucking traditions from one church, bring it into another church, and kill off all the gospel joy and life and vibrancy of a local church, and that is the very issue at hand in the book of Galatians. It's what we're reading about in this book. About two years before Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Galatian churches. He had planted a handful of churches in the area of Galatia. He went in with his buddy Barnabas. They told people about Jesus. They preached the gospel of grace, that we are all sinners, that Jesus died for sinners, that when we believe Jesus, he forgives sinners, and then he welcomes us uh, into eternity. We have a hope and a home in heaven. And a whole bunch of people in this Gentile region uh, were becoming believers. They were turning from their sin. They were trusting in Jesus. They were born again. They're filled with the Holy Spirit and getting baptized. And uh, Paul then leaves town. He entrusts these local churches to local elders, and the churches are doing real good. Lots of people meeting Jesus. Things are going really well. Uh, um, everything's looking really good. And then a group of supposed believers come back uh, into this community. They're from a Jewish background. They come to these Gentile churches, and, and these people thought they were kind of the varsity team, okay? They had been Christians longer. They knew some more verses. They were very devout. They were very proud. They were very confident, and they felt the need to come into these new churches and kind of correct the things that had gone wrong there. Uh, we know them in the Bible as Judaizers, Judaizers. The message of the Judaizers in this church was essentially this. Hey, Love that y'all are down with Jesus. That's great. Jesus forgives sins. He's the Savior. But if you really want to be in the family of God, if you really want to be a Christian, you also need to get circumcised 
and followed the Old Testament laws and customs like we do. This group of people, they were very convincing. They were very confident. And the Galatians were starting to be deceived. They were thinking, well, Paul said that faith in Jesus was enough, but they have a point. Jesus was Jewish. There are verses in the Old Testament about circumcision. These guys seem pretty smart and they're pretty adamant, so maybe we should follow their rules and get in line. What harm could come? But like zebra mussels can suck the life out of an entire lake, this religious legalism that came in through the Judaizers started to suck out all the life from these churches, all the gospel joy. The Judaizers were like boats bringing zebra mussels from lake to lake, and they were spreading a new invasive species of legalism in these beautiful churches in Galatia. And Paul gets wind of this. He hasn't been gone that long, and he writes this letter. And in this letter, the gloves come off. Paul is adamant. He's saying, no, 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 no. Do not let anyone rob your gospel confidence. I don't care how impressive they are. I don't care how confident they seem. I don't care how much money they have, how influential they are. Jesus alone saves and Jesus forgives and Jesus is enough to bring you into the family of God. Jesus is all that you need. That's the the letter. That's what's going on as we hit chapter two today. We round the corner into chapter two. Uh, Paul is retracing some of his own story. It's a bit of a biographical sketch in order to explain to the Galatian church that the gospel of Jesus alone that he preached to them was in fact sufficient in the real thing. And that they don't need to add circumcision, obedience to the Old Testament laws in order to be saved. And so as we look at uh, the first 10 verses of chapter 2 today, uh, what's going to surface from the text is, is three truths about the freedom and life that we get from the gospel. And we're also going to see some really important warnings about the danger of invasive species that can come into any church and suck the life and joy right out of it. And so uh, the first truth that comes to the surface from the passage this morning is this, that the gospel transcends culture. The gospel transcends culture. Let me show you in the text, chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul says, and after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. So Paul's been a Christian for a while now. Uh, He's going to Jerusalem for presumably the second time. And Jerusalem was um, where the church got started. It's kind of the spiritual headquarters of the church. I went up because of a revelation. So God told him to go and set before uh, them, uh, and set before them, though privately, before those who seem to be influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. So Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's going to get presumably the other apostles together and say, hey, guys, this is what I've been preaching. Okay, So uh, he's been preaching the gospel, planting churches, but apparently Paul had been getting some of the same pushback that the Galatians were getting. These Jewish Christians were saying, I love that you're preaching the gospel. We're all in on Jesus. But Paul, you cannot forget circumcision. Your gospel is too simple. It's too much Jesus. If people want to get saved, join the family of God, they need to get circumcised. That's how it's always been. Jesus was Jewish, and so they need to be Jewish too. You could summarize their message essentially as this, that faith in Jesus plus adherence to Jewish customs and laws equals salvation. You might think, well, that sounds foreign, but, but it's not. It actually is very easy to understand how they got here. The Christian faith was started among the Jewish people, okay? The gospel came first to the Jews. Many rejected it, but many did receive it. And Christianity started almost exclusively among Jews in Jewish culture. And Jesus Christ and his glorious gospel is the fulfillment of the promises that God gave first to the Jews. It's the fulfillment of all of the uh, prophecies in Jewish scriptures. And so now as the gospel leaves Jewish culture really for the first time in redemptive history on a major scale and goes into new cultures, new ethnicities, new countries, new languages, the obvious question is, is the gospel goes, like what needs to go with it? Like, like this has never really happened before. And Jesus knew, or Paul knew the answer to that question because Jesus, he told us in chapter 1, had told him explicitly. He knew the gospel is for all cultures, for all language. You don't need to be Jewish to be saved. Um, you don't need to be Jewish to be a Christian. Uh, people can be Gentile, non-Jewish Christians. But Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's going to verify this message, not for his own conscience. He knows the answer. 
but he wants these young Gentile new Christians to have confidence. You are good with God if you have placed your faith in Jesus. And he wants to silence his naysayers. He needs to put this argument to debt, to, to bed. So here he is. He's before the apostles. He's in the capital city. He's come in. Everyone that's really fancy is there. And uh, he's going to present the gospel for him. And it probably sounds something like this. Peter, James, John, good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Wonderful lunch. Good to be here. Now listen, here's the question at hand. You guys met Jesus, learned from Jesus, walked with Jesus, and were commissioned by Jesus to tell the whole world how you can be saved. So Peter, James, and John, how do they get saved? Is it A, faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, and obedience to the Jewish laws and customs, or is it B, faith in Jesus Christ, period, enough? Can they be Christian Gentiles keeping their own culture and their own traditions? And Paul doesn't stop just at theory. This is not Bible trivia, chapter and verse. He actually brings along with him a case study. It says in verse two that he brings a man named Titus. Titus is the case study. Titus is not a Jew. He is Greek. So he doesn't know anything about Jewish culture. This is probably his first time in Jerusalem. He wasn't circumcised on the eighth day. He didn't grow up going to synagogue. He doesn't follow the Jewish, the six festival um, ceremonies on the Jewish calendar. Uh, but Titus has heard about Jesus. He's believed in Jesus. He's received Jesus. And he's now walking with Jesus. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's telling other people about Jesus. And it sure seems like he is a born again believer. So now Titus is the test case. He brings them before the apostles. Would the apostles require Titus to become circumcised? Or would they welcome him as a Christian brother, as a Gentile, just the way he is without circumcision? We read the verdict in verse 3. Paul writes, But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. There's the verdict. The Jerusalem apostles welcomed Titus into Christian fellowship without being circumcised. In other words, they confirmed that the gospel is for all people in all cultures and all places at all times. Salvation is not a Jewish thing. It is a human thing, and it's available to all who receive it and trust in Jesus. Now, this may seem elementary if you've been a Christian for a while. This may not seem like a huge deal, but City Light, let me tell you, this is a huge deal. <laughs> If you're reading your Bibles, you need to understand this is a big deal. Let me put it on the bottom shelf. If the apostles had voted the other way, in other words, if God had limited the gospel to Jewish culture, then as Americans, we would have to learn Hebrew. We would have to worship on Saturdays. We would have to practice the six annual holy festivals. We would have to keep the Sabbath flawlessly, and we would have to follow all 613 laws given in the Torah in order to be in the covenant family of God and be forgiven. How fun does that sound? Anyone? Let's sign up for that program. And our mission in the world would to be impose our Jewish culture on other people. They need to be Jewish like us, to impose Jewish culture on the cultures of the world so that they could know God too. But praise God, it's confirmed that's not the gospel. The gospel isn't limited to a certain people, to a certain culture. It transcends culture. It supersedes culture. It invades culture. It's for all people in all cultures and all languages at all times. This is amazing. Here's what this means, brass tacks. That means that as Americans, we can be thoroughly, unapologetically red-blooded Americans. We can celebrate Memorial Day here in a few weeks. We can grill hot dogs. We can listen to our favorite music. And we can worship God in an old high V building as the bona fide, legit, uh, real covenant people of God as Americans. It means our brothers and sisters in Christ in Germany can be fully German. They can speak German. They can eat bratwurst and sauerkraut and drink beer and watch Hasselhoff movies and everything that the Germans do. I'm totally stereotyping, but that's what I picture. That's my people. And they can worship Jesus in beautiful ancient cathedrals as the bona fide, certified, authentic covenant people of God. That means our brothers and sisters in China can worship Jesus in Mandarin, in Cantonese, celebrate all the Chinese national holidays and worship King Jesus in their homes and in their businesses as the bona fide, legitimate covenant people of God because the gospel transcends culture. 
In fact, not only does it transcend culture, Revelation 21 implies that in heaven there will be different cultures and nations still identifiable. There will be a redeemed and perfected version of all the cultures and languages and people of the world, and we will all be together, present, unified in the gospel, and worshiping Jesus together as a beautiful mosaic of God's diverse people. This is amazing. This is a big deal. The gospel transcends into every culture, making available the covenant of God to wherever people are at. So that's the verdict. The verdict is out. The gospel is for all culture. You don't need to become Jewish. But as we're going to read uh, on, there, there's, there's a warning that comes with that. And the warning is this, that adding to the gospel in any way leads to slavery. Adding to the gospel, that's our second point, leads to slavery. We pick it up in verse 4. Paul writes, Yet, because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, these are some real fun religious guys that we have in Christ, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment. Gotta love Paul, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So the verdict is out. The gospel is for all cultures, for all people, but not everyone is on board with this. Paul says that there's some false brothers that have slipped into church, and by demanding extra requirements like circumcision, they're actually leading the church into slavery. Now, here's the distinction between freedom and slavery that Paul is getting at here. In the gospel, we have tremendous freedom to worship God because we have unhindered access through Jesus and his work on the cross and resurrection. But when we add on requirements to the gospel, we're actually enslaving people. People become slaves to the other people's expectations of them, slaves to the cultural rules that are imposed on them, and slaves to thinking that they again have to achieve what they've already received freely in Christ. Paul says, you're putting them in chains again. These false brothers demanding that Christians have to get circumcised, it's like the boat that went into Cunningham Lake with the zebra mussels. Didn't seem like that big of a deal. It's just a ceremony. What, what's the big deal? Why does it matter? But it's a huge deal. Because when it spreads, it kills all the life in the lake. And a little legalism spreading in a church kills all of the joy in the life that is there. It enslaves people that Jesus has made free. Now, let me address a question that I hope at least some of you are asking right now. If you know your Bibles, there's an interesting tension that arises in this text. You might be asking, but doesn't the Old Testament actually tell the people of God that they are supposed to be circumcised? Like, I know it's a Jewish thing, but the Jews are God's people. And like, it was a big deal if you're reading your Old Testament, right? That the sons get circumcised on the eighth day. This is a sign of the covenant that we are in relationship with God. So these Judaizers, aren't they just being faithful, biblical believers, like they're not making stuff up. Like you have to eat spicy food and like hockey to be in the family of God, right? Like this isn't outside, like they have verses. We have verses that says to be the people of God, you need to be circumcised. Doesn't the Old Testament apply to us today? Hmm, it's a big question. It's a big theological question. Let me attempt in the next three minutes to explain theologically how we need to think about this. First off, let me say this. Um, what we have here is called a Bible, okay? It's one book, but it's made up of 66 books, and all of the books of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, are God's inerrant, inspired, holy, perfect word given to us, okay? So from the table of contents to the maps in the back, it's God's word for all of God's people across all of God's um, time, Old and New Testament. But let me say this, context matters, Okay? We need to read the Bible on the Bible's terms. And it's very important that we distinguish between the old covenant and the new covenant that God has with his people. So let me say this. Before Jesus came, the old covenant, it is true that God's people were required to follow not only circumcision, but also all the laws and the commandments of the Old Testament. The first five books of your Bible are called the Torah or the law. They contain 613 unique laws required of God's people. And God's people had to follow these. It was a heavy burden. 
It was hard. Rules and rituals and sacrifices and ceremonies. And the truth is, the holiest people in the Old Testament, of all of them, no one could pull it off. And the goal of the law, at least in part, was to show God's people his perfect, holy, righteous standard and to show them their deeply uh, seated sinfulness that didn't allow them to live up. And the goal was that they would turn to God by faith in his grace, saying, we can't do it. And they would be saved by faith rather than by their works. And God's plan from the beginning was that he would send the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes. This is very important. He does not abolish the law. The law is still in place. He says in Matthew 5, 14, I've come to fulfill the law. And Jesus comes and doesn't get rid of the old program. He fulfills the old program in our place as our substitute. He becomes the first and only person in human history to bat a thousand, to keep all of the law, and to be completely sinless in thought, word, and deed, action, attitude, and behavior. He is perfect, and the perfect one dies. He dies a cross, a death on the cross for our sins to pay off our debt for our penalties, and then he makes a new covenant with us. The new covenant is come worship God, not by law obedience, but through faith in the one who obeyed the law perfectly for you. And so now the question is, okay, if we come to God, if my faith is in Jesus, I've come into relationship uh, with God through faith in Jesus Christ, what do I do with these Old Testament laws? I just said they all apply to all believers and all this is all God's word. What do we do with the Old Testament laws? I'm curious how many of you are reading through the Bible reading plan right now. We're going through it in two years. If you're tracking along, we just finished Leviticus. There's some crazy stuff in there. Anyone, is anyone following along? There's laws upon laws. If you got a rash, you got to see this guy. And if the hair color is this, it's exhausting, you don't ever want to have a skin disease. The rituals and the ceremony, if the woman's on the cycle, she can go here but not here, and you got to, it's crazy. There's a law about everything. Well, friends, if we're going to be faithful Christians, shouldn't we, shouldn't we obey these laws? Who are we to say, I obey this one and not this one? What do we do with it all, right? That's what the Judaizers are saying. Hey, let's just, let's just go by the verses. You feel the tension? You should, Right? Let me give you what historically the church has used to help sort through all of this. Historically, we've been able to identify three unique categories of laws that are in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament law, there are three different types of laws. Number one, in the Old Testament, there are civil laws. Okay, Remember, God wrote the law to the Israelite people. He inspired it through Moses in their time of wandering, but the Israelite people were a nation. They were an actual country. They were headed into the promised land, and they were an actual identified country. So they weren't a democracy like the United States, okay? They weren't an autocracy like China. They were a theocracy, theo, like theology, theocracy, the rule of. So they were ruled directly by God. And as an actual nation ruled by God, they had specific civil laws, This included things like sanitary practices, building codes, penal structures for people who harm others. Do those national civil laws apply to us? No, we aren't aren't the nation state of Israel. They don't apply to us. We live in America. We have different laws. We have Romans 13. This says that we are to obey the civil laws of our land. So how do we live out these principles? Well, we obey the laws. Follow your local building code. Don't speed, don't shoplift. Uh, pay your taxes, right? Obey the law of the land. That's our civil codes. That's how we honor God. Uh, Number two, in the Old Testament, you'll find ceremonial laws. Ceremonial laws. Uh, These were the laws for the temple, for the worship life of the Old Covenant people. Ritual sacrifices, the Day of Atonement, dietary requirements, feasts, holidays, circumcision, circumcision, a strict church calendar. Do we follow these laws as a church? No, absolutely not. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled all of these laws in a way that they're not required of us anymore in the same way. Right? In other words, why don't we do a day of atonement? Because Jesus is the atonement for our sin. We don't need to kill a bull anymore. Jesus has atoned for the sins of his people once and for all. Uh, we don't have a temple anymore where we go and make sacrifices. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has actually come into the hearts of all of his believers, and now we are the temple. 
So we are the temple. We don't go to a holy building with curtains and rods and, and, and lampposts, etc. We don't have a festival of lights that was commanded in the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus came and he said, I am the light of the world. And then when he puts his Holy Spirit in us, guess what? We are now the light of the world. It's in our name, City Light Church. You are the light of the world, he says in Matthew 5. So we don't have a light festival anymore. The light festival is every day. It's Jesus' light shining through his people. And so the, the many ceremonies of the Old Testament are fulfilled and carried on in Jesus and his people. So we don't follow the ceremonial laws. Number three, the moral laws. Moral laws. These are summarized in the Ten Commandments. Do these carry over into the New Testament? Let me stress some of you out. No. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Hang with me here, okay? Uh, let me explain. The moral laws do not carry over in the sense, in this sense, that they are no longer the terms of our relationship with God, okay? They were satisfied in Jesus Christ, so in that sense, they're the terms of our relationship, but that's been stamped complete. We no longer relate to God based on how we do with the Ten Commandments. Like God, that's literally, we're gonna get into this in chapter four. It's a huge theme in Galatians. That's everything he's talking about here. This is not how we relate to God anymore. Like God's not looking down from heaven, grading on a curve saying, well, she's pretty good, not perfect, but better than most. And he's usually hung over on Sunday, so he's out. And he's uh, coveting on Zillow during the sermon, so he's definitely out, right? It's not the terms of our relationship with God anymore. So in a sense, it doesn't carry over. In a sense, it absolutely does carry over, okay? In, in terms of the Ten Commandments, nine of them carry over into the New Testament, not as a path to earn favor, but as a reaffirmed ethic for Christian maturity and sanctification. There are nine commandments that are actually referenced in the New Testament, and they are directly reaffirmed as applying to the New Covenant in the New Testament, and so we don't earn a ticket into heaven by not murdering, but is it still a good idea to not murder? Yeah, we're going to put that in the good idea column. Like, I think God likes it when we don't murder. That's still a Christian ethic, right? Um, still a good idea. We don't worship other gods. We keep God's name holy and we honor it. It's still a Christian ethic to not lie and steal and covet, uh, and, covet and cheat. So obedience to these laws isn't a requirement to get into heaven, to become citizens of heaven. Uh, but they are the way we respond to our grace-gifted citizenship in heaven. Now, of the 10, there is one that literally does not apply to New Testament believers. Did you know that? We don't have 10 commandments. We have nine. There's one that doesn't carry forward. It's the fourth commandment. It's Sabbath-keeping. Colossians chapter 2 explicitly releases believers from that commandment. And here's why. Because Hebrews 4 explains that our Sabbath is no longer a day, it's a person, Jesus Christ. So as believers, we don't rest on a day, we rest on every day. We are at rest with God and with each other because we have entered our Sabbath rest when we entered into relationship with God. So as Christians, should we take a day off work? Oh, probably a good idea. Does the Bible say you have to? No, it doesn't. It's not a moral requirement for you. But I vote we take two off. Let's go Saturday and Sunday. Anybody? Right? We have nothing to prove anymore. We're adopted in Christ. Let's take some time off. Now, theological excursies finished. Let me go back into Galatians here. Back to the argument at hand. The Judaizers were requiring circumcision of uh, the Christians because they had a verse. This was a law, but it was a ceremonial law. And the verdict that the Jerusalem Council, these um, apostles uh, put forward was no. Circumcision is not required for New Testament believers. Why? Circumcision of the body only symbolizes the greater work that Jesus was going to do, which is um, uh, circumcision of the heart, Roman two, Romans 2 calls it. It's the removing of our hard-heartedness of unbelief, and it's given a soft heart, a one that's belief and receptive to the Spirit of, of God. So very explicitly, as awkward as this conversation is, I have to have it, do you have to be circumcised as a male to be a Christian? No, absolutely not. Should you have your son circumcised at birth? It's a great question for mom and dad and the pediatrician, not the pastor, okay? All I can say is the, the Bible doesn't say you have to. You work that out with the doctor. I'm not even gonna weigh in. You can't go wrong, okay? That's between you and the family. So that's a lot historically and theologically that's going on. Let, let me ask, how does this come to bear on us in tangible ways? 
Well, one, I, I want to say it is a tangible and practical thing that we don't have to follow the 613 Old Testament laws. Amen? Praise God for that. That's a big deal. That's very practical if we're going to be biblical Christians that, that want to uh, obey the Bible. That's a big deal for us. But additionally, there, there's a principle here that transcends even that. Um, that anytime we add any extra requirements to the gospel, be it Old Testament laws that no longer apply directly or anything from our own tradition, religious culture, expectations, we are bringing slavery onto people and the Bible forbids it. Okay, so the application is here is, guys, we need to be really careful that we guard against putting any extra requirements on the gospel. Number one, we need to guard the purity of the gospel that we preach and teach either explicitly or implicitly in the way we relate to other people and communicate with others, we cannot add to the gospel in any way. Secondarily, we need to be on guard against voices that would speak into our church culture. Any religious uh, uh, zebra muscles that would come in and add a yoke of slavery into our church and the ministry that we have. And this has a lot of different forms. This is very practical. You see it all the time. I'll give you some examples. Some would tell you, you have to be poor to be a Christian. It's called poverty theology. It's an actual theology. They would say, listen, Jesus was poor. He calls us to identify with the poor, to show mercy to the poor. And you need to be poor if you're a Christian. And if you're rich, you're probably not a real believer. Poverty theology. Others would say the opposite. It's, uh, they would say, you need to be rich if you're a Christian. This is called prosperity theology. The idea being that you've been adopted in the royal family of God. God loves to give good gifts to his children. He loves to answer your prayers. And if you're not healthy, wealthy, and wise, it's because you're not believing right. You don't have enough faith, you're not praying right, maybe you're not a real Christian. Some will say, well, you have to have the right version of the Bible to be an actual Christian. This is a true story. It was a few years ago, I got done preaching, thought I did a real good job. Guy walking up to me after the service, I thought he was gonna thank me. He came up and said, why don't you preach from the, the King James Version? The ESV that you're preaching from has been corrupted by the devil and you're leading people to hell by preaching from it. You know how I replied? I said, hi, I'm Gavin. Good to meet you. What's your name? <laughs> Welcome to the church. And I am a non-confrontational guy, but the Holy Spirit told me, you need to stand flat-footed and not let this toxic water into this church. And I had to say, man, I appreciate your earnest desire for this, but you're wrong. And I'd tell him, I don't know if you know, but like Moses didn't even know English. Jesus certainly didn't speak English. And if you're all about translation purity, you gotta go a lot older than the King James Version, okay? Unless you're coming in here speaking Hebrew and Greek, you're way out of line, sir. And if you're gonna communicate that you need to read the King James Version or you're going to hell in this church, you will not be welcomed here again. Super fun conversation to have between services. I just wanted a donut and to go to the bathroom before I preach again, but <laughs> it was a, a moment that I had to have. I haven't seen him since, so praise God. Um, can be other additives. Some would say you need to adopt their pet social cause, uh, identify with their social movement, become a member of their political party, align with their convictions around schooling, homeschooling, public schooling, private schooling. You need to abstain from alcohol. If you're a real Christian, you need to speak in tongues or you're not a real Christian. If you do speak in tongues, you're not a real Christian because I read a book about strange fire and you're probably not converted. Anytime we do that, we are adding to the gospel. Paul says, no. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything we don't add to the gospel. And in all those issues, Christians are gonna come to convictions. That's a good thing. We should have and hold to convictions, but when we elevate our convictions to the level of the gospel, it sounds like we're being religious, devout, in a good way, honoring God. No, we are nullifying grace, we are confusing the gospel, and we are enslaving people to our expectations. And Paul takes it so seriously, he calls these guys false brothers. Like he's actually saying, they're not Christians because they are imposing a law to get saved. We have to be on guard against that. Adding to the law uh, leads to slavery. I'm going long. I got one whole more point. Stick with me here. There's one more last truth that surfaces in our text, which is this. Though the gospel message never changes, gospel methods do. So here's where we got, this gets tricky here. We, we got to work through this. Let me, let me show you how this passage ends. Uh, verse 6 uh, through 10. It says, And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. 
Uh, those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. I love Paul here. He's saying, listen, I met with these guys. They had a bunch of initials after their names, in their emails, funny big hats. They were a big deal. Meant nothing to me, but if it means something to you, I shared the gospel. They green-lighted it. Hope that helps you. Verse 7, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, okay, this is the Gentiles. He's saying, God sent me to the Gentiles just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel, same gospel, to the circumcised, that's the Jewish people, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through mine to the Gentiles. He's saying, listen, we have one gospel. It's the same message. It's the same message that's always the same. It's the same for Jews, for non-Jews, religious people, pagan people. The message is always the same, but you have unique people called to unique cultures and unique ministries to communicate it in unique ways. Peter was uniquely called to the Jewish people to share the same gospel. Paul was uniquely called to the Gentiles to share the same gospel. Verse 9, And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, here it is, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Verse 10, Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. He's saying the only thing they even added was make sure you're caring for poor people and there's a mercy ministry component to your church. He said, I was already on it. I was eager to care for the poor. Other than that, they changed nothing. We went to the people and they confirmed same gospel. Keep doing your Gentile thing. Don't make them get circumcised. We're gonna go to the Jews, same gospel message. To illustrate it this way, my senior year of college, uh, rented an apartment. My roommate was my good friend, Tyler. And Tyler and I were, are, are very similar. At the time, we were uh, newer in our faith. We were on fire for Jesus. We were eager, we're like evangelists at UNO, always sharing Christ on campus, leading Bible studies, doing all of that as college students. But in other ways, we couldn't have been more different, okay? Tyler is what I call an avid indoorsman. He's really good at indoors. Uh, he loves it. He listened to techno dance music by himself in the house. I'd come home, was like, ns, ns, ns. he's reading his Bible. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Tyler... <laughs> Tyler was the president of SIGEP fraternity at UNO, okay? Total frat guy, frosted tips, the whole thing. I, on the other hand, small town kid. I can't stand techno. It's horrible. I love hunting and the outdoors. I love country music. And I wanted to beat up most of the frat kids that I ever met because they just annoyed me, okay? It's like, you pay dues to get friends? Like, I make them through conversation. So definitely some ego in play there. Sorry to my fraternity friends in the room, but you had to buy your friends. Anyway, so... <laughs> Tyler and I, best buddies, loving Jesus, so different from each other. But guess what? Tyler was using, or God was using Tyler as a missionary to frat guys. Frosted tips, visor hat, pop collar, walked in, and he is reaching people that I would never be able to reach. Same message, same gospel, different people, different contextualization. God's using me to reach a lot of guys with camouflage hats on, on campus in trucks. Different context, different culture, same message, different methods, different missionaries. That's what Paul's saying here. We have this whole debate over circumcision, non-circumcision. Do we do the Jewish thing or do we do the Gentile thing? He's saying, listen, I went to the apostles and they said, yes, do the Jewish thing and do the Gentile thing, but don't confuse the method with the message. The message is the same to each. You can change your methodology. So Peter, circumcised brother, goes to the Jews. That's his main ministry. Paul's main ministry was to the Gentiles. He was circumcised, but his wingman, Titus, he says, don't get circumcised. I'm not going into synagogues. You don't need to do that. That's not a salvation issue. And Paul told um, Titus, yeah, we, we can go. Let's do the Gentile thing. But did you know Paul actually had another assistant, a young apprentice named Timothy? And guess what? Timothy wasn't originally circumcised in Acts 16 Paul encourages Timothy to get circumcised, and he does. Well, after going to the mat over Titus, saying, you don't need to be circumcised, he actually tells Timothy, no, you should. What gives? Here's the difference, because Timothy's ministry was to the Jews. It wasn't a salvation issue. It wasn't a gospel issue. It was a missionary issue. Timothy had to go into the synagogues to tell them about Jesus. You don't even let you in the front door unless you're circumcised. How did they know? I have no idea. I've never thought about it till this moment <laughs> as I'm preaching. Really uncomfortable. Had a check station like the boats. I don't know, but <laughs> welcome to this uncomfortable moment. We're all sharing it together, and I'm sweating. Um, so I, where am I? Uh, notes are good. 
Paul, you, you should get circumcised so you can be a missionary. It's a method issue, not a message issue. And so the gospel never changes. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but we deliver the message in contextual ways, different, mes- uh, different methods, different missionaries. And City Light, we have to pay attention to this. There are two ways that we can miss on this one, okay? First, we can hold very fast to both the, the message and the method, and that gets really bad, right? Like, so hold on to the message, that's a good thing, but the method, like, I grew up singing hymns. We sing hymns. These churches with their, their demon drum, drums and their rock star music and their worship leaders and bowling shirts looks like Charlie Sheen up here worshiping <laughs> with us this morning. They're not even real Christians. Well, really, are they singing about Jesus? Are they worshiping Jesus? Great. <laughs> I love that. Sorry, Will. He's in a bowling league. He's got a bowling event at one o'clock, so he came prepared. The shoes are in the car. Um, We can hold fast to both. The other option is we can hold loosely to both and we can miss it here. We can contextualize and say, yeah, man, we need to reach new generations and new cultures and we need to adopt music and we need to adopt methodology. That's all great. But then we can also say, but also sin is kind of falling out of fashion. Talking about hell, that's antiquated. No one really believes that. You know what's really in is like self-improvement and leadership skills. Let's be a church that teaches people how to win at work. Is that even a church anymore? Right? Shouldn't we be preaching about Jesus? And so we can hold close to both and we can miss it. Or we can be open-handed on both and we can miss it. But, but what we learn here is that we need to hold firmly to the message. We need to be flexible in the method. City like culture changes, practices changes, preferences changes, but the gospel never changes. And so one of my greatest desires and labors for this church family, for our little family of churches and this church planning movement, movement is that we would be unapologetically uh, committed to reaching new people and new generations with the gospel, with the same gospel that never changes. I want my great-great-grandchildren to be worshiping the church that does things very differently than us, that has very different music, but preaches the same gospel message, and for generation and generation to come. And to do that, we need to do two things. We need to preserve the gospel message. We can't give an inch on the gospel. We need to be so open-handed with methodology. We cannot bow a knee to our preferences and watch other generations slip away. We need to be vigilant to keep out religious legalism and spiritual zebra muscles that will enslave us. And we need to be adamant about lifting high Jesus Christ. Would that be true of us? Would that be true of our lives? Would be faithful to the gospel, flexible in our methods and relentless about Jesus Christ. I'm long over time. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you came and fulfilled the law. As we read through the Old Testament as a church, it's exhausting reading it. We think what a high standard. What a holy God that we have. He cannot stand any iniquity, any sin. Who can keep the law? And Jesus, you came and kept the law. And where we were enslaved to its requirements, you have set us free. We now come to God as a gift by grace, and we celebrate that. God, I pray for the purity of that message, that we would have profound confidence in the gospel as a church, that we would hold it close and hold it dear and be flexible with our message, or with our our methods as we communicate that timeless message uh, to a world that desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, amen.